The book takes us like almost up to the present day. Do you, do you wish you'd sort of held on for a couple more weeks? Well, you always do if you're doing something that's really current. And I managed, I was kind of, you know, on my eighth draft, I was get, eighth proof I was getting, you know, Rwanda and Ukraine and so on. <laughs> but, you know, you have to let go. So what I do is try and project forwards and say, you know, whoever leads the parties into the next election, the following trends are going to mm-hmm. be pretty current. And clearly the, the question of whether levelling up is the, going to be the new focus of either party's sort of trajectory from now on is clearly still current, whoever's prime minister. So is it possible to give us a sort of an overview of the the, the concept behind the book? That you, you're basically talking about how uh, the periods of chaos, periods of consensus. Um, periods of chaos are obviously bad. In your view, are periods of consensus good or is it more nuanced than that? I mean, it's just how things go, you know, I mean, you know, it's a period of economic growth is probably better than a period of recession. But, you know, they're storing up problems, which you then work through. Mm. So, I mean, the basic idea is that, you know, consensus is one of those words that people fight over a lot, ironically, because <laughs> um, it can sort of imply that politics is all about people singing Kumbaya and hugging each other in the mm-hmm. commons continuously. Obviously, that's never going to be the case. It's not the point. What a consensus is, in my view, is a shared taboo. It's something which we must not let happen. And across particularly the front benches, but broadly within the parliamentary parties and to some extent within the membership in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, 70s, we must not have mass unemployment Mm -hmm. before the war. We must not have huge deficits. Inflation initially come off the gold standard. And what that does is give a certain part of society, so finance before the war, trade unions after the war, it gives it a kind of concentration of power because that taboo protects it, its interests. The problem is that when the system that's predicated on that taboo stops working, when, for example, in the late 1960s, you know, inflation starts to go up and there are more and more strikes, people want to change, people want to move. Initially, some pioneers, then more and more people want to sort of say, no, actually, the nightmare we need to focus on is not mass unemployment mm-hmm. anymore. It's higher and higher inflation. But the the memory, the nightmare of the dull cues of the 1930s, what Keith Joseph calls the gaunt, tight-lit men in caps and mufflers, haunts people so strongly that they, they can't can't let themselves do that. So you end up in this sort of clash of nightmares, which goes on for years and years, where people try to work out what the worst thing that could possibly happen (laughs) is. And eventually enough people say, okay, actually the old taboo is less bad than the new threat. And so by the early 1980s, mass unemployment is no longer, you know, the worst thing that could happen. So it's almost like consensus is a, it's a terrible mixed metaphor. Consensus is a bed blocker for change. I mean, it's such a mixed metaphor that I'm not sure if it even works <laughs> at all. You know what I mean? Look, how much? So your book is a, is, a, is in many respects a, it's a history book. How much context can we find in your book and across the last century in British politics for the event of the past week? I mean, can we see the past week as a sort of a Britain, an argument Britain's still having with its past? Absolutely. And I think, I mean, broadly, I think you have these these periods where, you know, consensus starts to break down, you have an initial crisis, you have battle of nightmares, more crisis, and eventually a new consensus. So I would I would say that the way to see where we are now is from the financial crisis onwards. So from mm-hmm. the financial crisis, uh, through the rise of UKIP, through Brexit, through COVID, uh, into the cost of living crisis. And, and, you know, what has just happened is that a solution, a political solution that was uh, provided by Boris Johnson's sort of quite transgressive, very transgressive political uh, way of doing things in the summer of 2019 has now reached the end of its arc. But mm-hmm. at that point, when the Conservative Party just came fifth in the you know European elections, which we weren't even meant to have because we were meant to be <laughs> out of the Europe, mm-hmm. you know, et cetera, he, that, his very transgressiveness was what was needed to break this kind of absolute logjam. And actually, you know, ironically, the deal that he made was a concession that Theresa May wasn't prepared to make mm-hmm. in some ways. But but so that's that's the context in which you would sit, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of the past, in terms of where we're going, you know, fairly obviously it focuses attention, as I'm sure you've already been talking about, on, you know, whether uh, the Conservative Party wants to focus on holding the red wall seats and what follows from that, whether it wants to go back to something that looks more like sort of Thatcherism 2.0, as some people have inevitably been calling it, or whether you can do both at the same time. Would you say that by instinct, indeed by practice, Boris Johnson is or is not a consensus builder? Because I sort of can see arguments in both directions there. Well, I think it works in two, two stages. So Similarly, if you look at Thatcher, there's many differences. But Thatcher in the mid-70s is saying consensus is fudge. Consensus is just a, a, an excuse for not making a decision. It's an excuse for compromise. I suspect if you'd started talking to her about the Thatcherite consensus mm-hmm. in 1986, 1987, she might not have liked the word. But she'd been <laughs> a lot more happy with the concept. So so Boris Johnson was, a, was helping to kind of continue the breaking of the old consensus. You look at the sort of things that he was saying, compare it to where the party is now, 
it's kind of extraordinary, you know. You know, the treasury has misled the country in terms of focus, too, you know, too much focus on the the the, the wealth of the southeast. Uh, you know, we must we must you know in his opening speech, virtually when he's in Manchester, second speech, you know, he's talking about people who've been left behind, forgotten people, and all that sort of rhetoric. You know, which you could quite easily see being spoken by people in either party. Mm. Now, all of that is now on the back foot fairly clearly but at that point he was most definitely kind of i think trying to break from an old consensus and push towards a new one you know as i say the question is whether what happens now is something that looks more like you know mm -hmm. everything since 1979 or something that we've not really seen in the book i think i'm right in saying you basically argue that the, peri <laughs> the periods of consensus that we focus on we should actually be more interested in the periods of sort of turmoil than perhaps misery that both precede them and and follow them right yeah, I mean, I think we should be interested in the whole lot, but I think <laughs> I think the idea that I mean, I think I suppose the thing that that keeps springing to my mind at the moment is you know when a little kid gets sick, a really little kid, you sort of think that they 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 used to feel well and now they feel ill and they're going to feel ill forever. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this sort of yeah. absolutism about it, new, new so, state of reality, yeah. right? Exactly. And so, a lot of the conversation I think you've heard the last few years, really since Brexit been you know are political norms permanently dead mm -hmm. you know are we moving permanently into this sort of terrifying era of populism i think it's much more useful to see it as part of a, a long difficult messy democratic process and that democracy as part of its nature when it starts to have to change its mind when a democratic country needs to change its mind it takes ages and it's humiliating and it's frightening and it's messy and that that sort of fear and mess is part of the process and eventually you get to a sort of strained compromise you can sustain for a couple of decades and then it'll happen again but it's, the point i would make is it's all part of how democracy changes its mind give us some examples then of these sort of uh, the this this hundred years of crisis these other these other crises that we have passed through that we could perhaps take heart from today by, by thinking this this isn't new right okay so um a lot of people have made comparisons some of them ludicrous some of them quite pertinent between covid and the beginning of the Second World War. So if you just look at what was happening in British politics at the beginning of the, at the end of the 1930s, heading towards 1940, there's a, there are two great fears which now almost sound like the same thing. The fear of war and the fear of the Nazis. Mm -hmm. Actually, those are opposite fears, if you think about it for a second. Right. Yep. right? Because actually, if you want to defeat the Nazis, you're going to have to embrace war. Now, for a lot of people, both on the left, um, people like Stafford Cripps, and on the right, people like Neville Chamberlain, both of whom write books called The Struggle for Peace in the late <laughs> 30s, right? Um, for them, at least to start with, and for Chamberlain really all the way through, war is the worst thing. And in the other, in, in both parties, you have the opposite position. So Hugh Dalton in the Labour Party, Winston Churchill fairly famously in the Conservative Party, saying, no, actually fighting the Nazis is the most important thing. And certain things follow from that, like a bigger state. So I would argue that by facing the kind of terrifying nightmare left over from the First World War, exacerbated by the bombers, that, you know, war is the worst possible thing, that it's going to destroy civilization, by actually sort of facing that down and accepting that that's less bad than the Nazi boot on your neck, you go through that process and what comes out of that is a post-war consensus that can then be applied in domestic policy mm -hmm. and makes possible helping the unemployed in ways that in the mid-1930s were absolutely unthinkable. Fast itself. Firstly, I guess... Describe it, and to what extent was it really a consensus? Well, I think one of the things that people, I would argue, get overemphasize about the post-war consensus, the post-war settlement, is the National Health Service. That's the kind of the great iconic thing on the face of it. But actually, you know, particularly recent histories have emphasized the way that the welfare state has its origins well before that, far before that. And of course, in 1979, Thatcher doesn't abolish the post -war, uh, doesn't abolish the National Health Service. So I would argue that it's as I was saying before about, you know, shared taboos, the, 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 the core of the post-war consensus is very specific. It's we must not go back to the mass unemployment of the 1930s. Mm -hmm. What then follows from that is a slightly more sort of contingent consensus, which is the government and the trade unions will try to kind of make things work in a reasonably friendly way. Now, there are plenty of strikes. So again, as I say, it's not everyone singing Kumbaya. Mm -hmm. There are plenty of strikes, but there's also lots of trade union leaders going in and out of the Ministry of Labour, including under Conservatives. There's lots of Conservative Ministers of Labour, including Ted Heath, who get on pretty well with the trade union leaders. So it's, it's rough and ready. But then on top of that, there's this sort of term which really comes in from the States, I think, in the 50s, 60s, of sort of consensus politics, which is this sort of vaguer idea that everybody's kind of getting on quite well, which is the thing that I think gets quite a lot of attention, but is 
the one that's spongiest and flakiest. And and that starts to break down, I would argue, pretty much uh, specifically with the, sea, the, the strike of the National Union of Seamen in 1966, uh, where the government, Wilson government, is desperate to push up productivity, desperate to have, uh, you know, lim- a 3% limit on pay, and the, the seamen want a lot more than that. And it's from then on that you start to see, you know, statutory incomes policy is a deadly phrase but Mm -hmm. actually hugely significant because what that means is kind of consensus by fiat uh and from then on you get into ted heath and and the strikes of the 70s and and eventually it all breaks down but it's a as i say it's a sort of messy long process so you can you can sort of see it i mean you could see it breaking down almost from the beginning if you want to so the last 10 to to jump the last 10 to 15 years have been a time when all kinds of consensuses have been under attack if not just broken the consensus that we were that we more or less everybody believed that we should be in the european union the consensus that that uh the scotland scotland and england were were best off joined together um and indeed um well i i I guess we might even say sort of uh the consensus about economic consensus about about about, um about capitalism about the free market um the last one that consensus sort of seemed to be under major attack from from Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. That seems to have faded away a little bit, right? Uh, yes, I think there's uh, Corbyn's Labour combines two or three things which are easily mixed together, but actually we should separate out. One mm-hmm. is the personality, uh, well, not personality, but the, the person of Corbyn mm-hmm. himself. You know, who is available to kind of represent the left at that point in 2015? Well, actually, somebody who's older than Blair and Brown. Mm-hmm. So he brings with him a certain sort of period and baggage and so on. Then there's the young supporters who are, you know, who feel very sort of fed up about, you know, tuition fees and the job market and the post-crisis of the world. And then there's a sort of broader turn mm-hmm. left economically. But I would say that if you look at somebody like the head of the CBI saying that Thatcherism devastated the economy of the north of England, or the IMF calling for greater equality, or the editor of The Economist saying she's a Keynesian, <laughs> or Diane Coyle mm-hmm. saying that the, the whole professional practice of economics is beginning to jettison some of those old shibboleths. I think, like, like I say, it's messy and it's three steps forward two and a half steps back but i don't think that corbyn and corbynism is the be all and end all of an economic shift i think there's something broader at work there as you can see from boris johnson's speeches i love the way i think someone once uh, 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 talked about those two competing forces in corbynism as that it was the leninists and the john leninists which i think works <laughs> works terribly well so look the, the the way that break i mean you, you write breaking consensus often involves creating the nightmare mm-hmm. uh tell me about that about that in first in the context of the past that we've been talking about, but also in the context of what that could mean in the present? Well, I think, I mean, as I say, there's a battle of nightmares that develops between these sort of competing visions of, of you know, what we must not allow to happen and therefore, you know, where we're, where we're going. And I think, you know, that, as I say, took place in the 1930s, took place in the 1970s. And I think pretty obviously you can see it taking place now. I think there are, there are two, and, and, the, and the crucial thing is that in each of those cases, there are plenty of people, and we've seen this in the last few years, saying, oh, can we not just have a government of national unity? Can we not just have a coalition? Mm-hmm. Can we not just all get on with each other? And my argument, I'm not saying it's a good or a bad thing, but what tends to need to happen is you have to fight out the underlying battle. You, can't, you can only get to a new settlement by facing the different nightmares, fighting it out, and eventually ending up somewhere new. So, you know, I think you can see pretty obviously between 2016 and 2019 that there were things that were absolutely intolerable to many, many people, which, you know, had to be confronted. I think there's a really interesting example of this with the way that immigration went, you know, where a lot of the, and this is not in any way to belittle or dismiss this point of view Mm. at all, but, you know, a lot of people's fear about what would actually happen once Brexit took place was, was a nightmarish vision. It was about authoritarianism, nationalism, populism, even racism and fascism. Now, I'm not saying remotely that any of those things are absent, but I think some of the more uh, sort of full-on visions of what was going to happen haven't actually been borne out and that actually what you know, Dominic Cummings was arguing, that if people are given back a sense of control, mm-hmm. we can debate whether it's real or not, mm-hmm. but if people are given back a sense of control, immigration will cool as a topic. And I think we've seen that happen. So I think to a certain extent, sort of confronting the, the, the possibility of it happening and sometimes just going on with it anyway, does end up taking you, as I said at the end of the 30s, does end up taking you somewhere that you thought you couldn't go and actually is a lot less nightmarish than it looked like it would be. So at the start of um, sort of this week, uh, yeah. Keir Starmer said, with Labour, Britain will not go back into the EU. Uh, is that... What is that? Is that a new consensus? Is that the breaking of an old consensus? Well, I think it's both, isn't it? I mean, I think, I think you know, 
from where we are right now, after the week we've had, you know, mm-hmm. the idea that there's a, any sort of new consensus forming looks pretty Pollyanna-ish, right? But mm-hmm. I think if you look a little bit more long term, I think exactly as you just said, uh, on the EU, between at least the front benches, go no further than that, but, you know, there is, a, there is now a settled view that, oh, for heaven's sake, let's not have another referendum, you know, rightly or wrongly, but that seems fairly settled. I think, you know, there has been, it's maybe gone back a bit, but there has been a, a settled view that some sort of more interventionist government approach to sort of industrial strategy is important. So, you know, you had the government investing in a huge uh, battery factory in, mm-hmm. in Sunderland and so on. I think there's a fair amount of consensus in the context of the environment, in the context of, of a more aggressive China, in the context of Ukraine war and COVID, that globalisation and the just-in-time supply chains are maybe not, you know, a perfect way to run things. And you know, reshoring uh, is is more something we need to think about. So I think you can, and as I say, on immigration, I think you can see um, moves in a bitty sort of way towards something that looks a little bit more focused on those sorts of values around, you know, uh, sort of not quite national self-sufficiency, but an economy that's less sort of fully globalised and that, you know, people people find the word term post-liberal and for reasons I absolutely understand rather worrying. But I think some of the more sort of vegetarian forms of post-liberalism I think you can see coming through yeah fascinating okay so uh, I've only got a couple more questions but the the the, the conservatives 2019 success in in the red wall uh how does that play into the idea of consensus and consensus is being broken well I think you know the the night the 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 loudest nightmares over the last decade have been you know the nightmare of the economic center right that if we have a bloated state you know we're going to have huge levels of inflation the sort of George Osborne Mm -hmm. nightmare we're going to end up like Greece and then you had the sort of liberal left nightmare that you know if we embrace patriotism and belonging and security and all these slightly worrying ideas we'll end up you know as this sort of rather threatening uh regime as well something sort of Trumpian um and I think what you can see with the red wall is uh the 2019 election rather is another nightmare starting to get a little bit more attention as it did in some ways through the Brexit vote as it did in other ways through Corbyn which is just people who feel like they've had a really rough time they've not Mm -hmm. had a pay rise for over a decade their high street is dying you know there's this rather snooty idea that from their perspective perhaps that you know if you're bright you go to London, mm-hmm. or at least you escape from Accrington or wherever it is. And that actually, you know, that is a nightmare that's harder because it's more diffuse. It's harder to make it, and it doesn't have that much presence in the, you know, in the London media. It's harder to hear that through all the noise about incipient dictatorship. But actually, I think, you know, in the long term, probably the 2019 vote, and to some extent Brexit, is about that nightmare at least being audible. It may mm-hmm. not become dominant yet, but I think that's where we're probably headed. Okay, final question. Um, Ignoring consensus for a moment, I'm focusing instead on chaos and nightmares. Uh, how does the um, how does the last week rank? Looking at your book in terms of uh, periods of, of of chaos and madness, I mean, is it is it is it up there, or do we not know we're born? Uh, I think it's pretty pretty low, really. I think it's <laughs> it's. Uh, I mean, okay, so there's a really telling moment on uh, Wednesday night on Newsnight. You had uh, the the question, and Stephen Bush was sort of saying, no, this is not going to happen. But the question, which was around for about five hours or so, is Johnson going to do a Trump? Is he going to mm. hang on to power in the in the face of everything? Um, and you had Martin Lewis on the same same discussion saying, uh, in October, you know, the energy price cap's going and people's bills are going to go up to £3,300. Mm. And that, that's, I suspect, <laughs> is the night that's where the we prices. might remember. That's the night. 